It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Margaret Mitchell, MSP. Before becoming an MSP, Margaret worked as a primary teacher for many years and then returned to university to study law. Margaret represents Central Scotland and the Scottish Parliament and is also convener of the Scottish Parliamentary Cross-Party Working Group on Dyslexia. And this morning she's going to tell us more about the role of the working group and why dyslexia matters in education in Scotland. Margaret. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's my unenviable task to be following that presentation. I mean, I'm tempted to ask Tanya, what on earth do you do in your school? <laughs> Uh, really is amazing and you know just the whole journey takes so much of the things that we've learned on the cross-party group as it's evolved. I thought in the, the time available what I'd do is give you a, a kind of overview of the cross-party group, the background to them, what they actually are, how they've evolved and developed and also look at how dyslexia matters within the, the context of our findings. Um, but can I begin by, by thanking Edinburgh uh, Napier for holding this event today. It is Dyslexia Week this week from the 3rd to, to the 9th of, of November. And um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to come along and talk about what the cross-party group is doing. And all of this, of course, helps raise awareness. The cross-party group was for, uh, founded in 2005, January 2005, and it was Rosemary Byrne and myself um, who founded it. Rosemary was a, an MSP, a, a Scottish Socialist MSP, and a Conservative MSP. And it tells you a little bit of the meeting of minds when it's a particular issue in cross-party groups with MSPs that sometimes that's when the best interactions come and you form these relationships that perhaps aren't uh, evident when you see people knocking lumps out of each other in, in the chamber. I have to say that um, Rosemary did a lot of the speed work in, in getting the, the group un, up and running. Sadly, she lost her seat um, in 2007 and I've continued as the convener ever since. That's almost 10 years the, the cross-party group has been in existence. There's very, various rules and regulations about starting the group and I think it's important to understand some of that. Just now I, it'll probably surprise you to know there are 88 cross-party groups in, in the Parliament and um, they work at various kind of uh, levels of effectiveness. Uh, you have to have the, the support of at least five MSPs. It's got to be across the parties, so that would be the four main parties, plus the independents, Labour, Liberals, um, Conservatives, uh, SNP and the independents. And the, the Standards Committee approves your remit, and our remit is for... Um, to, to raise awareness, to, to present a forum for a discussion, to look at the issues and, and to see how we can affect policy and engage with MSPs. To be it, you only need two MSPs and it will probably surprise you to hear just how difficult that is to achieve and you're thinking, for goodness sake, what on earth are they doing with their time they can't just spend? Um, an hour, um, we meet maybe four times a year, every three months to come along and listen to something as important as this. But when you think of the, the actual parliamentary sitting time and what's um, put into that, on Monday then, well here I am today talking at Napier, I'm going to a lunch for deaf blind and presenting an award there. I haven't looked at my, my, my justice papers for, for tomorrow. Um, there's Labour business on Wednesday. I don't even know what it is at this stage, right, let alone get my head around what I'm going to say. So um, there are huge pressures. The, the meetings will be either lunchtime or they'll be in the evening. There's lots of parliamentary receptions, um, Poppy Scotland, um, epilepsy, you name it, there's a reception for it, all encroaching on parliamentary time uh, and MSPs. And it's not 129 even that you're choosing from because the cabinet comes out of that and ministers come out of that, so that's 21 right away. And the presiding officer would never be a convener of the cross-party group. So you're beginning to see how um, it really is quite squeezed and it can be very difficult to, to get even two. And it's important to get two because um, it's got to be a mem another MSP, doesn't matter if it's the same party, because then your minutes all go on the website. It's a very good parliamentary website and I, I would encourage you 
to have a look at the dyslexia website. It's got a note of meetings and it doesn't just say we met, this is who was the speaker. It will give you quite a, a good um, precy of what was discussed. So the nature of MS, of cross-party groups, isn't necessarily, and this is managing expectation, about engaging with a whole lot of MSPs. And I know Sir Jackie Stewart, who is the, the patron of Dyslexia Scotland, gets very frustrated sometimes when he gives up his time to come to the Parliament. There might be five, which I consider to be a real result if you've got that at a group meeting. But, you know, it isn't full of MSPs. But that begins to, to um, and give you an idea of why that isn't the case. But what it does do is provide this forum to raise awareness, for people to come along and talk about their experiences, to, to look at opportunities to influence government. And we can influence government in a number of ways. For example, um, SPQs, Scottish Parliamentary Questions. Um, I've asked a lot of these about the the toolkit, about the, the definition, about continual professional development. Members debates, we've had members debates on dyslexia, various aspects of it, recording it, identification, the collection of data. I think it's important though to recognise that they are not Scottish parliamentary committees, quite different. There are only 18 Scottish parliamentary committees, um, seven are mandatory including the standards committee that approves the existence of the, the cross-party group in the first place and 11, um, 11 subject committees. What you can't do in the cross-party group is you can't raise commercial interests and you can't take up individual cases. It's not a forum for, for lobbying or for someone to come with agreements in the cross-party group to take up a specific case. But they can look at the general kind of things that may have gone wrong in an indi individual case and follow that through. Now I have to say that the cross-party group in dyslexia is without doubt one of the best cross-party groups and it's absolutely nothing to do with me. I'm only there as a facilitator. It's the members of the group that really drive where the cross-party group and goes and, and what it achieves. And the membership in the cross-party group in dyslexia is so wide, so varied, it's, it's tremendous. It's individuals who have dyslexia, it may be um, individuals who fam have family members who are dyslexic, it's organisations, representatives from that uh, who help and support people with dyslexia, it's employers, so we've got people from army, they've got teachers, they've got colleges, we've got even a member from um, Edinburgh Napier University. So there's a vast um, width and breadth of experience and we're particularly fortunate to be supported by Dyslexia Scotland who's there in the background giving um, huge support and, and giving us um, direction. Without doubt then a convener must be an MP, an MSP, um, uh, but a vice convener can be a member of the cross-party group or a secretary and whether it's the vice convener secretary post I see that as absolutely pivotal in just just determining direction for the group and we've been very fortunate in having two superb um, secretaries. The first was Moira Thompson who may be known to some of you and I was delighted to write um, a reference or just um, a, a little bit in support of the recent award she got for um, her, her work with dyslexia as a tutor over the years, the experience. I can't tell you the, the the benefit is if I've got someone coming with a problem in dyslexia to phone Moira and ask for a little bit of direction and she never lets you down, she's always got a positive answer for somewhere that you can go. So Moira was the secretary from 2007 to 2011, replaced by David Jones who's just so um, so passionate, such a deep knowledge, just so sensible about um, where the group's going. So. To overview where we kind of where we are and, and what's happened in the last ten years, yes, we have made progress, but equally it's still hugely frustrating. And the Conservative group had uh, an education debate. Part of our very long and extensive motion was additional support needs, and I thought that's a great opportunity to to get in there and talk about dyslexia, dyslexia and the kind of problems there. 
and, and part of it was that it's hugely depressing at 10 year, year, years later, then we're still seeing so many people not identified in primary school, not even secondary school, maybe being college or the workplace before dyslexia is um, identified, that people are still having to fight for assessments and that there's still a lack of educational psychologists to carry out these success, uh, assessments and that the support isn't in place. And that's the negative. On the positive side, then, I mentioned from 2007 to 2011, then Moira was the, um, the secretary. And during that time, some of our members were part of a working group with the government. And so the definition for dyslexia uh, was, was agreed, so that there is now an agreed Scottish government definition of dyslexia. It should be rolled out to all the local authorities, but they still aren't using it. Huge task, very difficult to do because um, there are so many different, different sort of strands of dyslexia. The yellow acetate shade made a, a huge difference to Tanya. That might not have helped someone else. So it took quite a long time to work on that definition, but it's there now, it's agreed, and that must be a, a fantastic starting point. The other thing that was developed in that time, again, with uh, members of our group working with the government, was the Dyslexia Toolkit, aimed specifically for teachers um, who are out there and have a child in the class who is dyslexic. And certainly, you know, my interest was, I know somebody's, you know, mixing up numbers, things are, are, are round the wrong way, the letters. Can I have them tested? And then what's the support there? And <coughs> the <coughs> cross-party group, the toolkit wasn't available when I was teaching, which was quite a little while ago, but it is now. And it's not just for teachers, it's for anyone seeking support, parents worried and, and looking for a bit of information. <clears throat> then that's a good place to start. From there, we've kind of worked on a kind of thematic approach in the last three a year, years or so. And from that, uh, there's certain key meetings that, that really stick in my mind. One of them was with um, Sir Jackie Stewart, who's the, the patron of Dyslexia Scotland. And he just came in and talked to the, the cross-party group, explaining just how difficult it was for him at school, that um, he, he felt stupid, he was labelled stupid, um, he didn't know what was wrong, but um, school was not a pleasant experience, and if he could skip off, then he did. And basically, um, he said things could have gone very badly wrong for him. He was hanging out with the wrong people and, and he could see quite easily how people could drift into that or be depressed or um, just a lack of self-esteem and confidence that we know um, all, can all come from not having dyslexia identified and support being available. And he said that the pivotal thing for him was when he discovered that he had a, an aptitude for shooting. Uh, and that was the start. He could do something and he could do something well. And from there he went on to the the rally driving and Formula One. Uh, and today he's, he's passionate about um, the kind of experience that we're still seeing in schools where people are fighting for assessments and schools aren't listening and, and don't seem to be uh, aware. So that was certainly one um, very key meeting that you know members of the group were talking about their experiencing t experiences too. Uh, and underlying the fact that dyslexia isn't just about literacy, about uh, reading and numbers, it's about the kind of impact it can have in confidence, self-esteem, depression, maybe mental health, or maybe getting into, um, in the worst case scenario, the wrong crowd and ending up in, in trouble. So from there, um, another key meeting, and actually, um, I think just a few months later was the the launch of the Dyslexia and Us booklet. I don't know, have any of you, how many of you, any of you seen this, Dyslexia and Us? Well, get it, it's excellent. It's stories from ordinary people, from um, famous people, um, people that you will recognise, all seeing just the, the kind of problems that they've had. Um, because they're dyslexic and uh, the lens sometimes they would go to hide it and the coping strategies that they had to use and things that 
you know, you may take for granted finding the direction, having to fill up a form, you know, oh, I forgot my glasses today, could you just do it? All these kinds of things to try and cover up the fact that this is something that they couldn't actually cope with. It's very good. At the same um, reception that we had in the Parliament, there was a lady called Jane Edwards there who had just become the education supporter of the year, and that was a very innovative um, programme and project that she had on the farm, helping dyslexic children go there and working with them, building confidence and helping them to look at, you know, different ways to do things. Um, other, other sort of meetings that kind of stand out would be, for example, the farmer that came along pretty, pretty recently and said that he's, he can't fill in forms, you know, and he, there's nowhere, there, there's anywhere, uh, you know, anyone to help him. And, and from that then, the NFU has, has taken up what he said and they're now running a campaign um, to, to look at farmers and crofters and to give that support because we know that that's a very isolated and can be a very isolated community. If any of you work with the Samaritans, you know there's always a line to the farming community just because, you know, there can be depression there and if you're dyslexic on top of it, uh, being isolated and, and worried about your business or the animals or some pressure, then that's fantastic to know that the NFU now is behind behind them too. There was also a lady from East Renfrewshire, and again when Tanya was speaking and just what she said at the end, who talked about IT um, and the way she'd used IT to work with dyslexic children and how um, the rest of the members of the class at the end of it were saying, I wish I was dyslexic, you know, this is really great, and oh look what they can do, these kind of things, just turning it round, not a negative, very much a positive, because from my, my teaching, my, my um, experience of people with dyslexia, and from hearing what we have today from Tanya, then they have a very different way of thinking. So there, there's innovation there, there's um, thinking out of the block, there's an entrepreneurial spirit and, and just talent there that, that's to be tapped into. So these are all things that we, we, we've been working with with other um, agencies. Going on then to look at the barriers, the thing that we spent probably most time on just recently is looking at the Education Scotland consultation and report. Now this was commissioned by the Scottish Government, it was to look at um, people with dyslexia and additional support needs. Now before I go on to that I should really just mention one other meeting that we had and it was a wee bit poacher tongue gamekeeper meeting in that Mike Gibson, who had worked with the Scottish Government for quite some time, special needs education, all of this, um, retired and played a more active part in the cross-party group. And he's done some superb work on data collection. Now we know that about 10% of the population are dyslexic. Yet in somewhere like North Lanarkshire, where uh, I live, or live in South, but it's where I represent North and South Lanarkshire, Central Scotland, then out of, say, 20, is it 26,500 uh, pupils, 34 are identified as being dyslexic. And in the annual return um, in September, the school census, that's the figure that goes round down. So we know Identification isn't there, there's a huge um, underestimation of the, the size and scale of the problem. So this report commissioned by the government, the consultation by Education Scotland, has been <clears throat> very thorough, talked with parents, gone into schools, primary schools mostly, um, lot of secondary schools, college, further education, talked to everyone except young people. One people, the one um, section that were, were missed out. The cross-party group has, has pointed that out because young people come along and their stories, they know exactly where they need the help. The SQA coming along and um, telling us that they're entitled to scribes, they're entitled to extra time in exams. It's not known under the um, support legislation, it's not being given. So these are other areas that um, are good for MSPs to follow up and press the government on continually. But the main kind of findings that um, the Education Scotland came out was, uh, with was, for example, uh, a common theme from day one 
in the cross-party group, the inconsistency, not just between local authorities, but within local authorities, and we're still, even with two schools, maybe only two or so miles apart. Where in one school, um, a child who's dyslexic will um, be identified, will be assessed, will have the relevant support there, and the other school where they're not even on the starting block. Now, despite this being a common theme from day one, ten years later, here we are, still saying the same thing. Testing, fighting to have to get tests, the lack of educa educational psychologists, the fact that 24% of uh, primary schools weren't uh, aware of the, the toolkit for teachers, and that some local authorities are still thinking, well, what should our definition be of dyslexia? I mean, it's really tear your hair out stuff. I mean, it's there, it's sitting there, it's ready to go. The toolkits, they're ready to go. Somewhere there needs to be some joined up thinking. So kind of to conclude what I'm saying and, and why dyslexia matters and where we should be going, then the Education Scotland report is a very realistic report and it, it does pin uh, an accurate picture of, of the barriers facing pupils with dyslexia and um, additional support needs. Now, at the same time as this consultation was going on, there was a petition in the Parliament, one of the successes, I think, of the, the Parliament is the Petitions Commission uh, Committee, where anyone can go with a general kind of proposition, and it's looked at by the committee, and it's looked at seriously, discussed, and moved on. Now, this was a petition just expressing concerns um, about the, the funding for um, additional needs support being cut and just saying under Griffith, getting it right for every child, then surely that's the last thing that should happen. So the petition's been closed because it's been referred now to the Education Scotland document and the ministers are replying to that. But I have to say, when I raised a lot of the things just on... Um, it was only Wednesday last week, there was still this, look, we're doing quite well, look at all the money we've spent, we've got a dyslexia-friendly school. Yes, 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 all positives. But we're still not um, identifying, assessing and giving the support we need. So what do we need to do? Well, um, it's got to be looked at in terms of preventative spend. That's what the government says that it's focusing on. We know budgets are tight. And my goodness, if we did... Um, provide this assessment and identification early and, and looked at the right numbers, the proper numbers of people who need um, support with dyslexia and the wider additional supports needs, of course there's bound to be a huge preventative spend saving uh, as people go through later in life and um, if they go into um, unemployment, if they go into depression, if they, if they don't realise the full potential that all comes at cost. So even, even on that scale, you think it would make sense to look at it. And then there's the equalities issue, because there is most certainly an equalities issue here, that people that have this potential are not having it realised, that parents very often who can very least afford it are having to pay for independent assessments in order to, to finally have it recognised that their child is dyslexic or in need of additional supports. These are two very strong um, themes and anchors and um, just pointers that we're going to be holding the government to account on and hopefully that we, we can make some progress. But in the meantime, the group's heard really good stuff uh, and I want to leave you with this kind of thing. For example, we've heard from Skills Development Scotland about the work they've done with employers and um, working with individuals so that when school leavers um, look for employment and they've got special needs or they're dyslexic, then they're looking at the strengths, not the weaknesses. Now that's good to see, but at least they're starting it. You know it's not happening everywhere, it's not happening anything like everywhere, but it's up there, it's in the skills development Scotland, that must be a positive, um, a positive way forward. There's pilot projects in prisons, and, and Sir Jackie again has gone out there, and the fact that he's been such a success and was able to say, look, I felt stupid, I was labelled stupid, I was going the wrong way, 
I could be in your shoes today, has made so many more of these people who have literacy, numeracy needs and are dyslexic come forward in prison. And they've got in the prison SPS, the big plus for assessment and individual learning programs. And again, you know, that hopefully will pay dividends to, to look at that individual and see where their talents are, where, where their skills are, and make sure these used. I've mentioned the NF. You, they're already running a very successful campaign that I think will make a huge difference. And I mentioned young people. Well, there's an inspirational young person um, who has started Ellie's Blue Ribbon campaign. And I must say, one of the most fulfilling meetings I had was with Ellie. And the other people then who had uh, kind of joined into her campaign, she's an ambassador for dyslexia, and she developed the Blue Ribbon. I don't have it on today. I should. They're up in the Parliament. Um, but it's a blue ribbon, you know, just the, the normal wee sort of ribbon that you, you get, light blue. And... Um, just wearing it meant that, you know, pupils in school would say, oh, what, what's your ribbon for? And, and that person that was dyslexic would say, well, I'm dyslexic. What does that mean? And, and you know, it was just this, this ability, I can tell you why I have problems, and, and this is what it means, and this is dyslexia awareness. And just for them opening up, I mean, there was one... A uh, little girl who said, you know, I wasn't very good at maths and, and reading. I've had to um, repeat a year and I wore the blue ribbon and then everybody understood why. You know, it was just such a, a huge um, difference to be able to say, I, I'm not stupid, I have special needs that, you know, now are being identified <coughs> and, you know, is helping me to cope. A huge difference for young people there. And we're moving on now to look at this dyslexia friendly label, dyslexia, that's not easier to say, dyslexia friendly farmers, schools, dyslexia friendly colleges, universities, local authorities, employers. So that's how I hope things will start to develop. I hope the cross-party group can continue to play a positive <coughs> part in, in making sure that every young person who's dyslexic gets that entrepreneurial skill, that innovative way of thinking, and um, is able to, to realise their, their full potential. It's been a bit of a journey. Hope we're making a difference. And um, I think it's just a case of watch this space for uh, the, the recommendations from Education Scotland. If they're followed through and we follow through and we start with that assessment in primary school as early as possible, then um, so much more can be achieved.